We're back for Caravan of Garbage. It's a new era of movies that we're doing from an era long ago. Not long ago for some. Some will be like, 1978 was like bloody yesterday. Well, guess what? You're old. Oh, whoa. Surprise. We got you. That's right. This isn't for you. (laughs) You've never done a TikTok dance. Get out of here. So uh, if you could leave it like that, it'd be great because we are going to be covering the four and potentially five. We'll come back to that. (laughs) Superman movies, the Chris Reeve movies. Because right now we are surrounded by DC properties. The Snyder Cut's coming out soon. Mm -hmm. Uh, We just had... Uh, Wonder Woman. Yep. And Wonder Woman especially, as I understand it, people uh, putting it together were like, we're going to harken back to a more innocent time in superhero movies. And if you remember that, you're old. Guess what? You're (laughs) old. (laughs) That's right. Well, Superman the movie, we've done a a previous series of videos on the Sam Raimi Spider-Man movies starring Tobey Maguire. And I've said of those that even though I don't love them, I think they are a perfect distillation of comic books in like celluloid form. It's like if you just got everything about the comic books in all their silliness and you put it on screen and that's what it is it's not it's not a real universe it's not it's not like our real world and it's got superheroes in it it's a superhero universe and it's kind of simplistic and silly yeah and that and that works in that universe and i think the superman movies the richard donna and uh richard the, lester richard lester <laughs> and chris you know christopher reeve Margot yeah. Kidder, that whole deal was the the prototypical attempt of that. Yes. And I don't think it works as well. I think uh, I think there's so much of this that does work, though. And, yeah, like you said, I think you've got to look at things like, you know, it's got a long, drawn-out title sequence, which I normally, yep. like, I do not like. But uh-huh. something about the John Williams score mm-hmm. and just, like, the, the era this was in, I'm like, yeah, I could sit here for 12 minutes. Well, what's interesting <laughs> in re-watching it is that I think... Because I, you know, I consider these kind of hokey yeah. and kind of, you know, kind of, kind of silly and simplistic. I think these were probably even hokey at the time because they're yes. not, they're not an adaptation even of the Superman comics at the time. In this movie, Clark Kent is a is a mild mannered reporter for the Daily Planet, but in the comic books at the time, he wasn't. He was an on air TV anchor for like WGBS Galaxy Broadcasting. Yeah, right. Like they'd move the character on, and so this isn't like an adaptation of the comic books at the time, it feels way more like an adaptation of what the writers... Remember? Remember, and they read as a kid. And the George Reeve kind of... Yeah, it's it's more an adaptation of that. And and, and you can see that sort of in the the character design and in the costumes, like Christopher Reeve often dresses in like an old, sort of an outdated, like double-breasted suit like he's the Superman from the 40s. Yes. Um, Even the opening, because it's it's a black and white like comic book and it's it's a kid telling a story and then it like transitions out to this like, it's 1978, baby! If if you're watching (laughs) this when it came out, guess what? You're young! That's right. (laughs) You're not now, just to clarify. But yeah, I I think it, yeah, it definitely, it definitely aims for that and I think it also, it it nails a lot of it. It I think it, it nails it on that level given that that, again, the writers of this were not comic book writers. Mm. Like, and even at the time, I think, even when we were approaching this era of, like, it's it's got to be a blockbuster, but it's also got to be... Films still had a certain amount of prestige. And the reason, I yeah. guess, they didn't get comic book writers for this is because even though they were adapting a comic book, they were like, that's kind of a low art form. The thing that has always... That I was always let down on watching these movies is that I always watched them and thought, I don't think anybody who ever wrote a comic book was ever within a hundred miles of these movies. <laughs> and we'll get into why I sure. think. But if if you look at the the list of credits, it's originally Mario Puzo who, yes. who wrote the original Godfather novels. And then I think there was a full rewrite yeah, on there top was, of that. It was Tom uh, Mankiewicz came in and is credited for like the Richard Donis, what he ended up shooting. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But I think also they got names like that and Marlon Brando and Gene Hackman And obviously, like, Chris Reeve and Margot Kidder were relatively unknowns at the time because they were going for this kind of sweeping epic to be like, this is real, you know what I mean? We're we're, we're taking a genuine swing at this, Uh you know what I mean? I think if they were just like, it's fun and comic books and adventures, people would be like, well, that's not very serious, is it? You know Mm. what I mean? I think they were going for, like... This is proper prestige filmmaking. And it certainly looks the part for a lot of this. It's uh, Jeffrey Usworth does the uh, cinematography for this and he, he passed away like almost immediately after this after this film came out. It's actually oh. dedicated to him. And th- there's such beautiful shots in this movie and there's kind of like, a, like an ethereal glow to a lot of it, which mm. the other movies do not have. Well, half of two does, which we'll come back yeah, to next sure. week. Uh-huh. I also think it's interesting that a lot of this stuff also sets the tone for Superman to come in the future. Not just movies, but also comics. A lot of the, the lore kind of folds in. The the House of Al symbol being the S on oh, sure, Marlon yeah. Brando's uh-huh. chest, that right, was right. then folded into 
know, all the comic book stuff and, and whatever. And, of course, these movies eventually get a sequel of sorts in, in the shape of uh, Superman Returns. Which we did look at, yeah. We which is that. essentially the same universe. Yeah, but also, like, Superman Returns doesn't look anything like this. Yeah. Like, I <laughs> guess it sort of has the feel. But just look at The Office itself. It's like, this is kind of a grimy 1970s New York kind of situation. Mm. And the other one's got this... Within spitting distance of the Statue of Liberty. <laughs> yeah, for some Unless reason. Unless that's the Metropolis Statue of Liberty. It must be. What I also think is interesting about these movies is one and two were shot back to back. It was like an 18-month grueling shoot. A 500-page script or something? Oh, my God, originally, too long. Way too long. Must have been cut down. And I, I guess you can kind of see that it does immediately kind of dovetail into the next movie because the opening of the movie sets up the next movie. We don't come back to the three Kryptonians. That's true, yeah. Which I think must have been super unusual at the time to set up these villains that we don't see for another two years. Unless audiences at the time were like, good, these people are being punished. We enjoy a non-sequitur scene of people being punished. Oh, my God. Speaking of people being punished, I, I, love, I love just Krypton bureaucrats just going down in just a wall of flame and just bureaucrats <laughs> just getting a face full of glass. I just really enjoy, like, you know, you were told this was coming and you did nothing, so I appreciate that, as always, yeah. Parallels, Mason, to the modern world, maybe. Oh, I get it now. They're all in bunkers now. They don't give a shit. <laughs> The actors? <laughs> no, no, most of these people are dead. From Krypton? Yeah, it was thousands of years <laughs> yeah, ago. That's right. So what do you think of, though, the the, uh, the special effects of this? Because there's some incredible model work. There's a lot of clever use of, like, rear projection. There's one shot in particular that I love. After the Superman Lois Lane kind of flight. Mm. You know, the, well, see, that's the good. Flirty I mean, situation. The, the, the tagline for this movie, I think, was you'll believe a man yeah. could fly. And I think, you know, especially for the time, a lot of it seems... Pretty seamless. I've got a fun fact for that. Yes. So the flying, uh, there was a number of methods that they eventually used to get it together using wires and optical effects and all these different kinds of things. But the methods originally attempted included catapulting a dummy into the air, a remote control <laughs> model airplane painted as the character, and simply animating the flying sequences. But I think on the whole, considering the year that this came out, it's pretty solid and it gets worse as the oh, movies yeah. progress. For sure it does. Yeah. And, and I think, like, if I were to have one criticism, it is obviously that, like, physics doesn't affect many of the things that Superman interacts with. Sure. So he can pick up a, a you know, he can he can hold a helicopter and it just floats in midair. Or he can pick up Lois Lane and she floats oh, man, in midair. I love that scene with the helicopter. And but I, James, yes. obviously... <laughs> Uh, Superman projects some sort of gravimetric field that, that negates the that is what physics. Is, that's, how, it? Yeah. that's how that works. But that moment where he's got Lois Lane in one arm and he catches the helicopter with the other, it's spectacular, man. I know it's slow and it's from the 70s, yeah. but there's just something about that that I, that I really enjoy. But the particular shot uh, um, I wanted to talk about from earlier, where I got cut off Mason by you or maybe me, I can't remember, but the moment where uh, Superman leaves Lois Lane's apartment and then it's one shot and it pans over to the door and Clark Kent walks in. Yes. The way they did that, that's rear projection. So they shot the Superman flying away thing and then had the real Chris Reeve knock on the door. There's things like that. And it's like, that's pretty clever, eh? Movie magic. Movie magic. I love it. I also like that they, uh, on the Krypton, they use the reflective uh, material that they originally went with uh, the lightsabers. Oh, they kind of, they flare that's up. That's why they... they all have trash bag suits. <laughs> that's right, exactly, yeah. Uh, but I also think a lot of the, the realism of this comes down to a couple of things. First of all, you mentioned the uh, the costume design. Uh, Yvonne Blake uh, did that. Uh-huh. I think it really works. But Chris Reeves' embodiment of this character and even little things like it was his idea to like bank when he's making turns. Huh. And I think that just makes that little bit of a difference to kind of, you know, to feel yeah. the realism Look, if of there it. Is, if there is one thing that I could point to as like the, the absolute positive of this movie, it's definitely the performance of Christopher Reeve mm. as Superman. And again, it is kind of hokey and it is, you know, of its time. He makes a point to push up his glasses every time he, yeah. uh, he, he uh, you know, speaks a sentence. But just the glowing ball of charm that is him in both, you know, versions of the character. He's got it. He's you got know what it. I mean? Yeah. Uh-huh. It makes sense that, you know, the, the subsequent casting of Superman and everything else has been so difficult yes because you've got to capture a certain charm that Absolutely. not everybody has but at the same time what wonderful superman we've had name dean one. kane oh, okay cool you've named one that'll do i could have named a better one yep <laughs> but you've made your choice i've made it haven't i so actually david prowse uh trade christopher reeve people don't know david prowse was in the darth vader suit uh, he actually got so big that they had to reshoot some stuff because he kind of went from like quite a lanky kind of theater kid to the, uh -huh. like, he's, he's 
especially like for the 1970s, he's pretty big. Big in the 1970s was whatever John Wayne looked like, if he was alive then, I've got no sure, idea. Yeah. But even the fact that principal photography wrapped and he stayed on for a year just doing the special effects stuff, just get dragged around on wires and sitting in front of blue screens mm. and all of these and all of these other things. I think it's great. I also think it's criminal that he got paid $250,000 for parts one and two. Oh, sneaky. When we've got some other players in this who put in much less effort. Who are you talking about? Marlon, Marlon Brando. Brando. Bad bloke. I know he's a good actor. That cannot be doubted. He's obviously one of the greats, but by all accounts, the worst man in the world. That's, that's a shame. His performance is very good in this, I thought. Well, the funny thing is... Have you Given seen, that he was only there for 12 days or something like that? He was there for 12 days and he made $14 million for 10 minutes of screen oh, time. Oh, because he had a percentage of the gross, Exactly, right? yeah. yeah. But there's moments in this where he's just reading his lines where he's like doing his monologue to the baby and he's like, I love this baby and we're sending this baby to Earth. There's a post-it note stuck to the baby? <laughs> yeah, is that? exactly, yeah. Okay. Or it's next to the baby or whatever it is because you see his eye line. He's not actually looking at the baby. Uh, he's just reading it. These yeah. days they just fix that in post. They fix it in post, exactly. They just move his eyes or they digitally erase the post-it note. So the other thing is... He was an incredibly lazy actor at this point, right? Oh, is this just going to be shots this is at just, Marlon Brando? I'm, I'm going to wrap this up in a minute, but in some scenes he told uh, director Richard Donner that the only way to keep his performance fresh and not over-rehearsed was just to record the first time that he read the lines. Ah. So just like, I'll do this once because this is obviously going to be the best one. This is part of my process. It's very important. I only do it once because <laughs> that's the most natural way. Uh, and I just want to also mention... Uh, Ben's going to put in a clip of this interview where Christopher Reeve just... just Pub publicly <laughs> trashes him. Yeah. The man didn't care. I'm sorry. He just, you know, took the two million and ran, you know? Yeah. Was it an exciting to work with him, though? Not really. No. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, he's right. Uh, Lex Luthor's good as well. Yep. I, I know. mean, the, the Lex Luthor yeah. we get. Look, at, uh, <laughs> the way I try to look at this movie, I've tried to look at it in two ways. One is just like a, a fun throwback adventure. Yep. Don't think about it too hard. It's just the newspaper comic strip... Mm -hmm. move to the big screen, focus on it like that. And the other way is to look at it as a very cynical old man who's watched way too many comic book movies and, and tens of thousands of pages of modern day comic books. You've been spoiled by the movie Joker, the high point of cinema. Exactly. So on the one hand, I'm like, well, this... Having you know, having just rewatched this, Gene Hackman puts in a, a fabulous performance he does. as a cartoon villain. Like it's <laughs> it's a, it's a great performance as as a someone going drats and curses Superman. Yeah. You've done it again. I'm the smartest man in the world. But as as a as a comic book fan who's seen you know dozens of different variations of Lex Luthor over the years, I'm like, this is not the Lex Luthor you want to put in the real world. He's just an absolute blowhard who thinks he's smarter than he is because he surrounds himself by idiots. Like he's yeah on the like on I mean the, I do like the little hijinks to be yeah. fair. There's probably too many hijinks. Yeah, like too many times where they try to go to reprogram the nuclear bomb. That, like yeah. you could do that in one scene. You don't need to do a second scene <laughs> right. to, to make that happen. Because like he's meant to be. He he considers himself the smartest man in the world. He's got enough money to overpay for a bunch of properties because it's a his his scheme yeah. is this real estate scheme. But also he lives in like a like an underwater hotel. Yeah, like just a just an <laughs> abandoned hotel, like a mole man. <laughs> What are you doing? What are you doing, Lex Luthor? Yeah, nobody seems to know who he is. But that being said, I think he's really great. Like, mm. genuinely. You know, and again, it adds that gravitas because, you know, you, you see the name. The second uh, billing of this movie is also, it's him. It's Brando, then him. Also, Margot Kidder is great mm, as yeah. Lois Lane. There were a number of other names considered at the time, one of them being Carrie Fisher, which I huh. think, man, that would have been very interesting also. She would have been... 19 or 20 yeah. at the time? Huh, yeah. Okay. But uh, she's like fun and fierce and she's like sm smoking cigarettes furiously. And, and a bad speller. <laughs> and a bad and, speller. And she's got like, she, she's got the perfect amount of big city cynicism yes. to, to clash against Clark Kent's Absolutely. small town innocence. Which again, we still kind of see, you know, to this day. But, but I think the interplay between her and Chris Reeve or her and Superman or however, we, however you want to frame it. You know what I mean? Yep. It's people playing people playing other people. What? <laughs> yeah. But they work really well together and it's because during the filming of this, it was grueling and everybody hated it and Richard Donner was like killing himself to make this, you know, but he's put together this fun atmosphere to keep everyone mm -hmm. going. They fired him immediately after anyway. We'll come back to that next week. But I think you get the genuine sense that those two like each other. You know what I mean? They've got, yeah. they've got great chemistry. Uh, the only bit I would say I don't love from that character is the can you read my mind in a monologue 
going oh, on. It's, it's it's a poem. Yeah, and it was originally going to be a song. Like she was going to sing. That's why it. all the lines rhyme. <laughs> yeah. There you go. So there you go. But I whatever. Loved one of, one of the things that I enjoyed, but maybe not for the reasons intended, was the the first scene where Superman appears in Metropolis and he does a night of good deeds. Yes. You know, saving the day all over the place and stopping crimes and getting cats out of trees. I love trees. it. Mainly for the consequences that I don't think anybody <laughs> thought about. Like Superman, you know, drops down in the middle of the street next to a police officer with a cat burglar, and he's like. This guy was robbing all these houses. You should arrest him. If I were that burglar, I'd just be like, "Who's this guy? I don't know what." <laughs> like he can fly. What else can he do? He, he put he put these diamonds yeah, exactly. in my bag. There would have been a lot of arrests, and then a lot of people let off for yeah. gross legal malpractice. I think at one point, uh, the little girl gets her cat yes, uh, was rescued to say, yeah. uh, from a tree by Superman, and then she goes into a house and she says, "There was a man. He flew in the, out of the sky and he rescued my cat for me." And the mum goes. Stop telling lies, and then there's the S, the sound effect of a clear like, audible slap, audible slap to the back of the head. Here's a fun fact. I was yes. going to save this for trivia. Uh, uh -huh. Mark Millar has that cat, like stuffed. Yeah. Huh. Comic book writer Mark Millar. That's right. Yeah. Huh. What do you think of that? I love it. He's a big fan. He loves this movie. You've ever read Superior? Yeah. It's good. It's a lot of homages to this. So I think though it could definitely use more Supermaning. Well, that's the thing. <laughs> it could use a different amount of Supermaning. Yeah. Different scales of Supermaning. Uh, different ways of saving the day. Like time travel. Well, see, that's the thing. Like I feel like <laughs> in not using anybody who ever was within a hundred miles of a comic book. What seems to have come through with the writing of this is, eh, it's comic books, you can just say anything yeah. happens. To any, you can just, just say you can do a thing. Just say you can look look at a Great Wall of China and it, and it comes back. See, here's the thing though. I think this movie does less of it. It's like the beginning of the Superman silliness. You know what right. I mean? Like there's a moment where he he jumps out of the building and the suit just kind of appears on him. Sure, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. But of course they kind of make the effort earlier in the movie where he, he goes through like a revolving door. Yes. So he changes sure. really quickly. I think that stuff really ramps up later where they, it's just literally anything. We've mentioned this before, but one of the reasons people don't like Superman as a superhero is because they're like, yeah, nothing can hurt him. He can do anything. Yeah. Who kind of who cares? And that was the problem that was facing comic book Superman writers at the time. Mm. And so in between some in between probably Superman three and Superman four, maybe uh, 1985, 1986 Superman was rebooted and they significantly reduced his power set. So they yeah. couldn't encounter these problems. And here's the thing. I don't think there is a problem with saying, just have Superman fly, de depending on your perspective, sure. either reversing time or flying back through time and doing that to save the day and, and correct some of the mistakes he made prior. But you, you need some rules on that. Yeah. You, because otherwise, the, the only foreshadowing for him travelling through time is that... They tell him not to? Marlon Brando <laughs> says, definitely don't do it. And then Superman also recalls that he couldn't, he wasn't daring enough to save his father or yeah, you know, yeah. he, he, to, to save Park Kent. He couldn't do it. Yeah. And then he's like, well, I guess I will meddle with history. And then there's no consequences. No. And look, you know, uh, far be it for me to write, rewrite a movie from decades ago now. But I mean, couldn't you just say that he had a, a device in his ship mm. that uh, enabled him to travel interstellar distances as a baby and he could use it once? Yeah, right. Okay, and, yeah. That, and that, you know, and, and then he chooses to use it to save Lois Lane and then he then he can't use it again or something like that. But what's to prevent Superman then going back in time all the time? Or the Maybe he does. Or the evil Kryptonians doing it. Right? Anybody who has that power set. It also opens up the interesting question of, are there two Supermen in this universe? Because right? <laughs> yes. if he goes back in time to stop Lois Lane being killed... There's a pre-existing Superman there. And that Superman isn't going to go back in time because Lois Lane isn't killed. So I guess one kills the other. <laughs> Maybe, yeah. Superman 3 style. God, Just chokes, so chokes him out. That's what I'm saying. There's a lot of time travel based ramifications. I think one is yep. Superman has to kill himself constantly yes. over and over again. <laughs> and also, every time he doesn't save a cat out of a tree, he's going back in time because he can't leave that cat to fall out of a tree and, and hurt its leg or whatever. Yeah, absolutely. So it's just him doing that eternally, yeah, right? Yeah. And good on him, I and say. And good on him. If you do want more and varied Supermaning in this, there is an extended cut. I remember it airing in Australia in like the 90s and every now and then it pops up in some versions where he runs like a gauntlet into Lex Luthor's underground weird lair. Ah. Like he's just shooting him with bullets and freezing him and all these other things are happening. And I'm like, why isn't that in? And yet you've got like a dam collapsing for 19 minutes. Sure. Which looks incredible, don't get me wrong. It's some amazing model work. Some of some amazing model work. <laughs> some amazing model work. But it's not the moments like that that I think make this movie. And I mentioned this when we talked about the Our Man of Steel review for Caravan of Garbage. Check it out. Links but below. Link maybe, I don't know. But uh, 
that Jonathan Kent moment where they just have that quiet conversation where he's mm-hmm. like, look, I can literally do anything. Why can't, why don't you let me do these things? Why isn't it okay for me to, to show people mm-hmm. who I really am? And he's like, because it's a, it's a waste of your abilities. Why would you? You can do all these. You could travel through time if, <laughs> if you want to, but don't maybe? Unless I die, then maybe do it. Mm-hmm. Maybe a heart attack's inevitable. I don't know. No, In can, the 70s, it is. Yeah, I know. But he can go back to like 1940 and be like, hey, you're my dad and eat healthier. <laughs> Do some cardio every once in a while. Yeah, you're right. Actually, that's a really good point. We invented this thing called jogging in the 70s. <laughs> yeah. Do some of that. But uh, did you know this movie actually has its own mustache gait? Really? A la Justice League 2017. I did not know that. Here we go. So Gene Hackman, uh, and he's very, this, this was also a very jovial situation. This wasn't Gene Hackman like, just really stamping his feet saying, man, I'm not doing this. Like he tells this story in a, in a fun, jovial way that an actor might recount in an interview. Oh, they yes. said. You know but what I mean? then bear in mind, he is an actor. <laughs> That's so right. maybe he's still furious about <laughs> That's it. true. So he didn't really want to shave his mustache off that he had at the time. Uh-huh. And Richard Donner said, look, if you do it, I, I will also shave my mustache off. So we'll do it together. We, we'll be, we'll be mustache brothers in solitude. Cause famously he didn't want to shave his head for this. And he wears a bald cap in one scene. Like, he does ah. wear a series of wigs, but he's like, no, 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 Gene Hackman doesn't shave his hair for anybody. Maybe you should, Gene Hackman, is all I'm saying. <laughs> so what he did, he, he went back into makeup, and uh, he, he shaved off the mustache, and he came back out, and he's like, look, I did it. Now it's time for you to shave your mustache off. And he goes, oh, okay, and he peels off a fake mustache. He tricked Gene Hackman! What? He, <laughs> he got him! What? <laughs> yeah. How long had he be, been wearing that fake mustache? That's a great question. Years? His entire <laughs> life? What an elaborate prank. Isn't that amazing? Wow. Yeah. Did he shave it off pre-production and get a fake mustache put on? I don't know by what the, he's up by to. the makeup hair and makeup team? He's still alive. So we should so, ask him. Somebody yeah. could ask him if they yeah. run into him. He's working on the next lethal weapon. Huh. So yeah, he's like 95 years old. Uh, I got some uh, super trivia, super stuff, Superman trivia. I'm ready, ready for this? Yeah. Uh, so here's some other names that we got for Superman. Yep. Now this list is it's a million names long, so I'm just going to take some. some it's a million ones. names long, and if I recall, it's literally anybody. Yeah, from the time. yeah. it really is. <laughs> so we got James Khan, Robert Redford, Clint Eastwood, uh, Muhammad Ali, Nick Nolte, Elton John, Albert Pacino. Did you say Elton John? Yes, and I did. moved on like it was nothing. <laughs> Incredible. Uh, Paul Newman was offered Superman, Lex Luthor, or Jor El for four million. Just just pick a role. Wow. And he went nah. And, it, and eventually they cast an unknown. No, or huh. relatively unknown Did at the you time. Say, also, Dustin Hoffman on that list. I Dustin think. Hoffman was on the That's list. That's the one yes. that I remember being like, huh? Yeah, It'd work well for the Clark Kent role, I guess. I, I guess it would. Yeah. He could he could bulk up <laughs> his height. <laughs> very wide. He'd be, just become very very wide. I know Stallone uh, actually got vetoed by Brando. He's still angry about this this particular moment in time. Huh. I think there could have been two Italian stallions on screen. But I think because a lot of people were comparing Stallone to Brando at the time. Ah, and he was like an, stuff. Yeah, and he was like a notoriously petty and jealous man, ah. Brando, among all <laughs> oh, the we're other... Back, we're back to Brando. Yeah, I didn't mean to be. I actually didn't even write this down. But among all these other bad qualities, this was one of them. And ah. so he very much like stepped in and was like, absolutely not. And look, to be fair... I don't think Stallone is a good choice for this. But th- there you go. Wow, it's almost like you and Brando are on exactly the same page on all things. <laughs> so here we go. More trivia, Mason. I'm ready. Uh, Christopher Lee turned down Zod be- oh. because he just moved to Hollywood to dodge taxes. Huh. He was like, I can't go back to England. There's taxes waiting for me there. I won't oh, have this it. was filmed in England is what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, a lot of it was, Okay, yeah. right, right, right. So the Mario Puzo script mm. that was uh, that was reworked into a mostly a completely different thing, even though he's like credited up top because people are like God Godfather. Sure, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. Uh, it included one very famous camp moment where Lex Luthor encountered Tally Savalas as pe- Kojak, as Kojak, and then Kojak offered uh, Lex Luthor a lollipop and asked him his trademark line. Who loves your baby? Because they're both bald. Is, I that, guess. is that the joke? I guess that's the joke. Here's another uh, Brando, a little bit of Brando trivia. And may, yeah. maybe oh, we're back on Brando. Brando. Yeah, now who's obsessed with Brando, Mason? Me, because you put all this Brando <laughs> ideas juice. in my head. All the Brando juice is dripping down my head. Crazy. Apparently, Brando proposed to one of the writers that in the first meeting with Jor-El, Jor-El would appear as a green suitcase or a bagel with Brando's voice. <laughs> but Donna persuaded him otherwise. I think that was one of his famous pranks at the time. Huh. And by pranks, I mean 
just being the worst guy, just holding up everybody's day. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, no, I Just the kind of guy that he was. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> Susanna York, who played Lara, uh, she wasn't really happy with the way that the script went because there's a particular scene where jor makes a big speech and, you know, gives him a magic crystal and all that. And he's like, you can uh-huh. do anything and I love you and whatever. And her quote from this is, I didn't give him dick. That, that, was, <laughs> that was what she said. And it's also interesting because... He puts his whole consciousness or like an element of mm-hmm. into this computing system so he can converse with his son in the same way that the Russell Crowe version does. Yes. And the mother just gets nothing. She just dies in an explosion. <laughs> I guess it's a tradition for On Lara. Proton, don't question their culture, yeah. James. That being said, yes. the Brando stuff had to be reshot for part two. So she does get a bigger role. Gotcha. Gotcha. Uh, okay, here's a question for you, though. This is a trivia. When the bit where Superman looks at the phone, that's not a proper phone booth, so he's like, oh, mm, yeah, yeah, it's like a clever yep, yeah, yeah, yep. What would happen now if they did that exact gag now? Would you look at one of those iPhone charging stations that you got to, like, you got to swipe a credit card to get 15 oh, minutes of good charge? Question, maybe, What's yeah. he stopping to look at? Ah, uh, uh, a TikTok house. <laughs> You know those houses where there's just influencers, yeah, sure. and they're all doing TikTok. They're all, they're all. They're, well, it just looks at the whole house. He X-rays it, and there's like 400 mobile phone devices and computers or whatever. And he's like, "Damn, I can't change into Superman in any of that." But he could. He could absolutely in a do TikTok. it. He just jump in there and do it. People would think it was a TikTok trick. Mm-hmm. There's a couple of things that I that I just wanted to make mention of. Uh, there's a moment where it's mentioned that Krypton is spelt with a K and not with a C. Yep. How do you know that? Good question. And also, why do you, uh, Clark Kent, say Krypton while your father very clearly says Krypton a bunch of times? <laughs> Krypton. 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 Huh? It's a regional dialect. Also, it's a Kansas dialect. Also, when you were learning all this uh, stuff about Earth and its people and whatever, mm. uh, Clark, when did you decide to just tell everybody all your strengths and weaknesses in a newspaper <laughs> article. Do you think that was a clever idea? Did maybe nah, maybe jor advise against that or no? Was it a, was it a very good idea? Dumb idea, right? Because think. it was, even though he, he told the dumbest man in the world, mm. he still got one up on him. Yep. And if it wasn't for love, he would have drowned in that pool. That's right. Actually, I got one bit of fun trivia, Mason. I'm ready. So at one point it was planned that the film would end with a giant hologram of Superman flying out into theatres. How? Are they just going <laughs> to be like... Now put on your 3D glasses. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Now they would have hired a bunch of out-of-work actors. Yeah, you probably just right. run up yeah. the aisle in a Superman yeah. suit. That being said, yes. there is something, and I dare to use the word, but, but I mean it, there is something magical about Chris Reeve drifting past the camera, like looking at the audience, giving a wink and just floating on by. I love that part of the Incredible. Superman. Incredible. Yeah, no, it's good. Yeah, it's good, yeah, I love it. Anyways, we'll be back next week to talk about Superman 2 and it's a nightmare. It was a nightmare to uh to make. Huh. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll get into it. But how was it to watch? We'll, we'll get into it. All right, let's do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, thanks for watching this though. This is Caravan of Garbage. We do this every week. If you want these videos early, which of course you maybe do, you can go to bigsandwich.co, sign up. We do bonus podcasts. We do movie commentaries. What else do we do, Mason? More bonus podcasts. That's right. We, we, do, we do a comic book club. Check it out if you want to check it out. Uh, I'm at Mr. Sunday Movies on Twitter. I'm at Wikipedia Brown on Twitter. Does this movie hold up for you? No. Oh, now, now I'm asking the audience. Well, I don't know because they're not here. <laughs> okay. Well, they'll have to tell you, In the they? comments, maybe. In the yeah. comments, maybe, yeah. Anyway, thanks for watching. We'll see you next week. Grab that gem, you guys. We'll see you real soon. Goodbye. Goodbye.